So let me summarize, put the summary up there of what an apostolic center is going to do. It is focused on believers being equipped and trained to be sent to walk in your purpose and your kingdom assignment. Concentration and focus on everything that we do. It restores the five-fold ministry gifts to function in the church. It equips not just a few. People think only a few people are called and they are the only ones that are ministers. But it equips not just a few, but all believers who will participate or who want to participate. God wants his whole church to be equipped because God doesn't just see a few folk in ministry. He sees all of his believers as ministers of reconciliation. You may not be in the pulpit preaching, that's for only a few, but everybody got something in them to bless somebody else. Amen, somebody. And that puts you in the ministry. Hear me today. It prepares these gifts to be sent or to be used. It is the biblical model that you see in the book of Acts, particularly Acts 19. It equips and trains how to win souls, how to disciple, how to get people healed, miracles, deliverance, signs and wonders. I'm believing God for more miracles to come, not only in the house, but when we touch people, but we got to be intentional about it. The prayer got to go up. The worship got to go up. When you come in and the presence of God is in this place and it touches you, then you are able to go touch somebody else. I'm telling y'all going to be on the job and touch some folk and they're going to have an experience with God right there in the workplace. The boss going to look at them like they are crazy. God is trying to get what's in here out there. But does he have enough people that are willing to jump into a new wine skin? There's only going to be, all I need is a remnant. And a remnant is nothing but a small group of people that have the heart of God that want to be where God is, that is willing to move where God is. You don't always have to have everybody a whole bunch. Everybody going to have to make their own choice. But God uses remnants, and then he builds on those remnants. Put up Haggai 1, verse 14. Stay with me, y'all. Anyway, let me read it to you. It says, so the Lord, there you go, sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, the governor of Judah, and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, son of Jezedek, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. Watch this. They began to work on the house of their God, the Lord of heaven's armies. So God just used a remnant. Gideon had to get rid of over 9,700-some folk that wasn't ready to fight for God, came down to just 300. But that 300 with God got the job done. I don't want, but those of you that have the heart to want to go. Some of you saying, I'm not ready yet. Nobody's going to put pressure on you, and ain't nobody going to make you feel bad if you're not ready for this whenever it happens. It's going to take me a time, a little time to get this going. But God uses a remnant, those that's got him in their hearts. The remnant got God in their hearts to want to do it. I'm not saying everybody in here that don't do it ain't got God in your heart. I'm not saying that. But sometimes the want to may not be there. And you may have to have a little time to adjust but God will use a remnant to turn stuff around. He took 12 men and turned the whole world upside down. It's always a remnant. Now go back to that summary. It is the biblical model that we see in the book of Acts. And then it equips and trains people to win souls, disciple, to do healings, miracles, deliverance, signs and wonders. It establishes new churches in homes. I'm going to give you a big vision. This is why I know it's from the Lord. I want to see one house on every street in Hickory Hill have some kind of presence of God in it. It can be a little house church. It can be a little prayer fellowship. But I want to go and get one home that love the Lord 
that will pray for their street. Man, you let me do that, Hickory Hill will change overnight. The crime going to leave and all the stuff. When you got at least one house on every street, trying to reach the other folk on the street and pray for the folk on the street, it's got to change. So I got to have an army that's ready to help me to reach folk that want to be reached, that will carry the vision to them. Amen, somebody. This has always been the New Testament model. Not one man sitting in front of folk and his gift is the only gift that's being used every week and sitting out here with hundreds of gifts, sitting in here that's lying dormant that's not being used. These are the differences that the apostolic center is going to bring. Now here the next problem is, is when people find out their gift, they just want to stay up in here in the church. And we, everybody's gift, you know, we, we got to have some influence out there. And everybody can't stay up here. Some people are called for in the house, but people want to stay where it's safe. And, and, and they don't want to go where the real work is out there. Them the folk out there, we got to impact in some kind of way. The difference in now, because we've done this, I've brought this up before, equipping folk and all that, but here's the difference in now from back then. Back then, I taught you, I trained with hopes that you would go out and find your own purpose. Now God has shown me I got to help you and give you a vehicle here that will provide you with opportunities to find your purpose. That's the difference that the apostolic dimension brings that I did not have. Even our vision of our church is apostolic. Love God. Embrace others. Watch. Touch destiny. And when you put it together, it means let God use you. Even the vision is apostolic in terms of getting people to move. Now, here's the theme for the apostolic. Watch this. This is going to bless you. Stay with me. Look at somebody next to you. Say, stay woke. Tell somebody on the other side, stay woke. Ephesians 4. 11 through 12 is the theme passage of Scripture, and it says, and I'm reading it from the Amplified, and his gifts to the church were varied, and he himself appointed some as apostles who were special messengers and representatives, some as prophets who speak a new message from God to the people, some as evangelists who spread the good news of salvation, some as pastors and teachers to shepherd and guide and instruct. In verse 12, he gives you the reason why he sent those gifts. And he did this to fully equip and perfect the saints, God's people, for works of service, to build up the body of Christ, the church. You know what the Lord is saying? I'm sending the apostle to equip in the apostolic. I'm sending the prophets to equip. Those who got a prophetic gift, I'm sending the evangelists to equip those who want to win souls. I'm sending pastors to equip them so that they can care for people. Let me say this to you. A pastor is not just a man that stands in the pulpit that preaches and is over a congregation. The word pastor means to just care for folk. So you can be sitting out there with a pastoral anointing. You may not be on the platform, but you have a heart to want to care for folk. You, went, you know, whether it's some women that, that's been abused and you just got a burden for them and you want to care for them. They stay on your heart. That's a pastoral call. So we have tradition has limited us and made everything traditional. Just the one in the pulpit, that one man, he the only pastor. Do you realize you only find the word pastor in all of the New Testament only one time? But apostle is in there at least over a hundred sometimes and prophets because God said he built the church on apostles and prophets, not on pastors. Now, there are a lot of men that have started church. They wear the name pastor and they've started churches. A lot of them may be apostles and don't know it or they don't want to use the name. 
But there was never a church in the New Testament planted or started by a pastor. They were always started by apostles along with prophets. And that's new for you right there. That's like, y'all owe me about $30 for that revelation. Come on. Get, get the buckets here ready so they can give me that. That's new. I know that's new, but that's the way. Tradition has messed us up. We'd have made church be building, microphone, podium, choir. That's our identity with church. But Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. You ain't got to have a hundred folk in order to have church. Church can be anywhere. It can be in the park. It can be a storefront. It can be in somebody's house. It can be at a business. It can be at an apartment complex. We have limited God because of our traditions. Some of you women in here, I'm going to tell you, a big hub of problems for many women is in apartment complexes. And we need to have women that will be assigned to win a particular apartment complex. Put them all on Zoom and try to tell them, hey, y'all got some more friends up there in the apartment. Have them to meet and pray for them women. See, we, we can get creative with this thing. We, we ain't got to be limited to just one little model. But we can be open to so many opportunities. Now watch this. Give me a minute. I'm coming. The church needs the fullness of Jesus. I'm going to say that one more time. The church needs the fullness of Christ. And Jesus was all five of those gifts. The Bible says in Hebrews 3.1, he was an apostle. The Bible says in Luke 24.19, he was a prophet. The Bible says in Matthew 4.23, he was an evangelist that spread the gospel and preached the gospel. The Bible says in John 10, 11, he was a pastor or a shepherd. That's what a pastor is. He cares for the flock. And then it says he was a teacher in Matthew 22, 16. All five of those Jesus carried, but in most of our churches, we ain't got but one part of Jesus, and that's the pastor. Ain't nobody winning souls. Ain't nobody speaking a word to people, giving them a prophetic word. There's no apostolic foundation. Every now and then you got a teacher or the pastor may teach, but you don't have but one aspect of Jesus' whole personality in most churches. What the apostolic center does is gets all five of those giftings of Christ operating in the house. Now, everybody's not going to stand in the office of these five. You may not be an apostle in terms of the office, a prophet in terms of the office, an evangelist in terms of the office, a pastor in terms of the office, or a teacher in the, but you can do the works of all five of them. Some of y'all are called to care for folk, as I said, as a pastor. You can work up under the pastoral anointing. Some of you are called to teach. You can work up under the teacher anointing. Some of you are called to be prophets. You can work with the prophets of the house and then get your prophetic gift activated. That's how it's going to happen, where we allow people to find their gifting. And as you open up and allow yourself to be equipped and learn, and I'm going to have a leadership man in all five of those areas. We're going to be so tight. We're going to love on you. We're going to embrace you. We're going to try to help you find who you are and help you to activate that calling that's on you. Y'all got gifts, but you've never been activated. And we want to give you an environment to where you can find your gift. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. It's like, watch this. If you were trying to build a house and you went and got a plumber to be responsible for building the house, the plumber can't see nothing but plumbing because that's his skill, that's his anointing, and that's going to be his specialty. He don't understand roofing. 
He don't understand putting up walls. He don't understand electrical work. He doesn't understand flooring. So you don't need a plumber to be in charge of building your house. You need a general contractor. Because the general contractor sees the gifts and the needs of all the areas of the house. He understands all of the different skills he needs in order to build that house. The apostle is the contractor. And I got the anointing to see the need for the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. But a pastor can't see nothing but pastoring. That's why you got to have apostolic anointing because God has given us the anointing and the ability to see the needs for all of those gifts and to use them. But a pastor is only centered on just caring for the flock. So that means we ain't got but one-fifth of Jesus operating in our church. One-fifth in most of our churches is all we got. And that's why that wineskin cannot help the new. You got to have all five of Jesus working and operating. Somebody give God some praise. The apostle comes. He has the gift of vision. He has the gift of establishing. Watch the people in the church they got projects, they got ideas of things, they got vision that they want to see. That means they got some apostolic going on inside of them. And so the apostle comes and establishes. Then we get them in the church and let the prophet confirm to them who they are. Here's your word. God wants you to do this. God wants you to do that. God has called you to do this and do that. That's why you got to have the prophet. The prophet can give them a now word right now. The Bible can give you uh, the word, the logos. It can give you the word of God. You can have revelation and all that. But that prophet will come and give you confirmation that will activate you in your call. Because now you know you're in the will of God. So the prophet will come and tell you, hey, you've been called to do this. You've been called to pastor. You've been called to be an evangelist. You get to find out who you are. And so now they come in, the, the, uh, the apostle has established the church, the prophet has spoken, now we need to keep people coming in, getting saved, and that's what the, all the evangelists want to do is get you saved. Once they done got you saved, they through, they gone out to get some more folks saved. They ain't going to do nothing else. They just going to get you saved and get you in the house, watch, and turn you over to the pastor. Now the pastor's job is to care for you, to pray for you, and all that. And then when the pastor has done that, he'll call the teacher in to come to disciple you. That's how all five of them get to work together. And we're going to need a lot of evangelists. We're going to need a lot of pastors because it's a lot. That's going to be the biggest group is the pastor because a lot of people need to be cared for in different ways. I've been arguing with preachers about women in ministry Talked to a guy not too long ago. He didn't want to accept that women were, you know, women preachers. I said, bro, listen to me, man. The Bible ain't taught that. That's just your tradition. But there are some issues women got that you as a man can't help. I'm in the house today. It's, it's, it's only so far I can go with a woman. There have been people that have called for counseling that were women. I may have turned them over to somebody else or my wife. And she's able to go there to places with them that I can't go. So you need women pastoring so that they can help other females. Help me, somebody. God is getting ready to raise up apostolic women in the house that he's getting ready to send out. I'm preaching in here today. Y'all don't know this finna be the great. You can't see it now, but it's getting ready to be the greatest thing you've ever had in your life. Preach Holy Ghost. All five of the gifts working. And then lastly, and I'm through with this one, I just want you to see the different opportunities you got in order to function from an apostolic center. See, I'm going to be providing these and a whole lot more. Number one, you can start a house church if that's your calling or a family church to reach your family. You can operate in one of the five gifts in the house. 
You may feel an apostolic call, a prophetic call, a, an evangelist call, a pastor call, or a teacher call. Next thing, you can start a church in the marketplace. Maybe you're on your job and your boss is very favorable about you having a little prayer group to come together. And then the seven mountains. God may have called you to be on. There's a thing called the seven spheres of influence. These seven areas have the most influence in the world because they mold the minds of people. And that is religion, family, government, business, education, uh, the media, and entertainment. God got some of you in the, those different areas right now, and all he wants to do is equip you so you can have an influence in those particular areas. Some of y'all can make your pulpit your cubicle, and you can carry your ministry out right there. Amen. Here's another opportunity. Um, start a 501c3 in order to address uh, some of the social ills, teen pregnancies, sexual trafficking, abortion, domestic violence, helping transgender kids. There's all kind of issues out there. And God may give you a burden for one of those areas and then let you draw up a 501c3 in order to meet those needs. Another area, apostolic women. I talked about women going into apartment complexes, reaching other women or in other places. Maybe you want to do outreach, pass food out to people or to homeless people. Maybe spiritual life coaching, you want to disciple folk. Maybe deliverance ministry, you want to get people set free from soul wounds or demonic spirits. Maybe a healing ministry, maybe a prayer warrior, because we're going to need to undergird all of this with intercessory prayer. So I need a prayer team to rebuild our prayer wall in the house. Maybe you're called to counsel or to encourage people. Maybe you're a worship person that wants to help like we did today, keep the worship going because the more we bring the presence of God down, the more we are touched to be able to touch other folk. And then our online campus, you just may want to do. On. It is something for everybody to do. God is saying, church, it's time to rise up, to get up and get out and touch. That is where we are today, is not to be sitting, but sending. Help me, Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody, give the Lord some praise. That's just a glimpse of the new apostolic center. I'll be giving you the vision over time. It ain't nothing that's going to turn over right away. I'm going to give you a little bit at a time and give you a chance to get adjusted to see it from a biblical standpoint. But that's the reason you're bored. You're bored and you feel like you're in the wilderness because you're called to do something for God and to take what he has put in you and to give it to somebody else. And I don't care how many different churches you go to, you're still coming back full circle to the same thing. And that is God wants to use you. But you got to get over that fear. We got to kick tradition in the backside and tell tradition to get out of here in Jesus' name. So, Father, I just thank you today that we have given your people your vision for the future. And I just pray now that you're raising up the remnant of this house. And we put our trust in you that you bring forth those that you have called for this different time. And we just speak an apostolic center over world overcomers, not only for in this house, but to impact this neighborhood, impact this city impact this region for the gospel in Jesus name put those hands together and give God stand up on your feet if you will I ask you all to pray for me this is new for me it's different sometimes it's very frightening cause um, I don't want to see the wine skin spill 
And we got to do it in a way where we can keep the wine skin together and give the old mindset time to adjust. I know this may be a little scary for some of you, but the reason why I'm confident about going is because I know God has called me to do this. And when you know God, I've been excited ever since. Would you put that prophetic word up? Remain standing because I didn't get a chance to share this with you, and I should have done this at first. But this is the prophecy that I got. Um, I told you about a young lady that uh, spoke this, and I want you to see how confirming this is. She said, the Lord is saying a rebirth. Now, she wrote this January the 9th. I didn't get the vision of the apostolic center until somewhere around about January the, the 17th, somewhere between the 17th and the 20th. She said, the Lord is saying a rebirth, a rebirth. There is a church of babes that I'm going to bring to this place. As the time swiftly passes, you'll begin to see more and more younger people come into this house. My house, says the Lord, began to prepare this place for them. She don't know nothing about what I'm thinking. God was giving her that at the time I'm praying. And she didn't know how to get to me. So the Lord told her, call Allison because they were friends. They knew each other. She gave it to my daughter. My daughter forgot to give it to me. And we were talking in the bedroom one night, me, her, and her mama. And she said, oh, Dad, I forgot to sing you this. And this is how I got it. And she sent the recording. And I had the young lady to transcribe it and write it out. But she says, begin to prepare this place for them. Watch this. For the former things in this place shall pass away. I'm doing something completely new. I must reposition you so that you can be in the right place at the right time for what I'm conveying to this to, to come to pass. This is a fresh start in a new direction. I'm going to release my fire like never before on these babes. This is revival. Tell all of those who are asleep during these hours to arise. To all those who are keen to traditional services, I am a God who does not operate in their traditions. I'm sending babes to be nurtured by you. Now, she's speaking this to me. I'm sending babes to be nurtured by you. They long to only do works in my name. And I'm sending them. Look, sending, sending. I'm sending them to be under your guidance. You are to direct them and counsel them. This is revival. Seek me on this matter so that I can order your steps. Everyone will not agree with the change, but I say to them, I am a God of transformation. <laughs> we are in a season leading to more of a great awakening and a shaking. Everything is being shaken today. The church has been shaken and still is being shaken. I choose this house, my house, this church, my church, to host part of the remnant that I am raising up here, get ready to embrace literal change as I shift the atmosphere once more as I've done before. This is revival. You know why us old folk, I'm 68 now, don't have the energy I used to, but my job is to take what I've learned train and equip this new generation and then send them. And those of you who are older that have been here a while will, are going to help me to equip these young people to get them out because they can re reach their culture in a way that we can't. Shanice Armstrong said this. She's a member of our church and one of our prophets. She said this on February the 13th. Prepare for the new and overflow of new people for us to train. Look at how God is confirming. Beatrice Dean, 
And none of them knew what I was praying and what God was giving me, but this is the, what the Spirit of God is given to confirm. Beatrice Dean said, and she's also one of the prophets here, February the 8th, for out of this church shall come men and women who shall teach the gospel the foundational things. Vivian Donaldson said, many souls will find their way once again for you to show them the way. And then Charlene Douglas said, I'm bringing a shaking necessary to shake out the old and stale to bring in the new and the vibrant. You will carry the newness into the arenas, watch, of the world. I rest my case. Come on, somebody, give the Lord praise. Come on, give him praise and glory. I want you to be praying for the Apostolic Center and be believing God with me.